Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Beth Cox, and this is Joy Wassel, and we are here with an organization called Decisions, Choices, and Options. And we are here to talk about, about some very, very important information about teen pregnancy. So why do you think your teachers have us come in here and speak to your class about this very important information? Why do you think it's important for y'all to hear this? Yes. Okay. Um, because... Pregnant a lot. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> teens are getting pregnant a lot in alarming rates, okay? It's a crisis in this country. Actually, Tennessee is number seven in terms of highest teen pregnancy rates. That's not something you want to be top ten in. A lot of things you want to be top ten in, but that's not, I know you're going to ask me who's number one, Mississippi. So, um, <laughs> but really, you really don't want to be top ten in this area, and we're going to show you why that should be an important thing for you to know. It's because you are asking, what's the big deal about sex, okay? What's the big deal? Why is it important to me to note this? Well, out of those who choose to be sexually active um, at this age, one out of every four, one out of every four will contract a sexually transmitted disease. And ladies, that's especially important for you to note because many of those STDs will leave you infertile, which means you can no longer have se I mean, you can no longer, <laughs> no longer have children later on in life. So think about how that impact will have on you when you sit down with your husband later on in life and you start to do some family planning, and because of a choice that you chose to make here in high school, it's now impacted you for the rest of your life. Many of those STDs will carry with you all your life, herpes and some of the other uh, uh, STDs that you'll have. That will impact you for the rest of your life. It is not curable. And 80% no, of all the STDs out there have no noticeable symptoms. So, guys, you're a carrier of HPV, and you don't even know that you have it. You might be infecting other young ladies. So that's some things to, to think about. Also, the economic impacts of this decision of having sex at an early age. 52% of all mothers on welfare today had their first child as a teenager. So again, this has huge economic indicators, and we're going to talk a little bit further, a little bit later about this. But if you want to assure your life of poverty for the rest of your life, become a single teenage mother that doesn't graduate from high school. And we'll talk about that here more in a little bit. Also, the national cost of taxpayers is huge. It's enormous. Um, I know you all have been hearing a lot about the economy and how bad the economy is right now. Well, a huge part of that uh, taxes that we pay go to pay for teen pregnancy. $10.2 billion of it's going to pay for teen pregnancy. And think about how much better that money would go to for education or other things that are really important to society, but we're having to pay for teenage pregnancy with welfare and food stamps and all those things to, to sustain those young ladies. Also, we already talked about the long-term effects of STDs, infertility, cancer, high risk of cancer, all those things will impact you. So that's a reason why this is such a big deal. So... This is a sexual exposure chart. This was given to us by the Center of Disease Control. And this shows you how many people you're actually exposed to when you start engaging in sexual activity. Now, it's no mystery to you all this morning, whatever. We hope that you choose abstinence. And what's abstinence? Yes. That's when you save yourself from marriage. Absolutely. You're saving sexual activity till marriage. It's just a healthier life choice. And we're going to talk about why that is. We're not saying that you never have sex, but we're just saying put that off until marriage because it's going to be a healthier choice for you, for your education, and even for your health. Because again, this sexual exposure chart talks about, again, how many people you're exposed to. So if the average teenager starts having sexual activity at 15, they'll have eight partners by the time that they're 22. So again, that is huge, but not only will they have eight partners, oh, what happened there? We got something going on on the computer. <laughs> and I was going to show you on this, and I was going to need to show you on the thing. Um, you'll have eight partners, but you're not just exposed to those eight partners. You're actually exposed to every single person that that person has had sex with in the last 10 years. So let me kind of show you, um, oh, okay, we're still working on this. Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, so let's use the statistical number eight. Some will be more, some will be less. How many people are you actually exposed to based on this chart? So let me read that number for me. 255 people. Okay, we just said that one of every four has an STD. So think about your chance of being exposed to an STD by that number. So to kind of further illustrate this, I'm going to use an example. If I were to take a cup and I were to spit it into a cup and I were to hand it to this pretty young lady right here, what's your name? Tierra. Tierra. Tierra's going to take it. She's going to spit into it. She's going to pass it around the room and everybody's going to take a chance spitting it. We're going to hand it to this young lady back here. What's your name? Lizzie. Lizzie. Lizzie's going to drink out of that cup. What would you all think about that? Ooh. Pretty disgusting, right? You wouldn't do it. Because you're exchanging bodily fluids, and that's what you do in sexual activity. You exchange bodily fluids, so you see how rampant it can go in terms of your sexual activity. Because there is no such thing as risk-free sex. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. No such thing as risk-free sex. Condoms break, they tear, they have holes in them, they have a, a failure rate of about 14%. They also, even if you look on the package, they said they do not help you um, prevent STDs. It will say it right on the package. Because if you had to store them properly as well, 
Guys, you put it in your car in this Tennessee hot summer, not going to be so effective. Put it in your back pocket, mama washes your jeans, not going to be so effective. Okay, ladies, birth control pills are not 100% effective. Your bodies react differently to different chemicals, and that's not always going to guarantee that you're not going to have an unplanned pregnancy. Um, also, if you don't take it the same day, every single time, you're not good about that, again, that's going to cause an ineffective rate of those. We've had three friends that have, or excuse me, a friend that's gotten pregnant three times on birth control pills. So you have to remember, none of that is going to guarantee um, that you're not going to get an STD or unplanned pregnancy except for abstinence. That's the only one. There's also an emotional, com uh, a emotional factor with sexual activity. And ladies, you all are very emotional when you're um, engaging in sexual activity. And that bonding agent, there's an agent called oxytocin that is transmitted when you have sex. That's a bonding agent. And every time that you're releasing that, you become attached to whoever you've had sex with. So you're probably wondering why these, why these couples keep breaking up and, and getting back together, breaking up and getting back together, because the woman has emotionally given herself to somebody, and it's very hard to break that bond. Because, again, we, we were meant to have that oxytocin with somebody that we bond with. So it's very important to note that. Also, the fear of rejection or getting caught or, again, the emotional factors that go on with you when you get rejected by a young man and he goes on to somebody else. So those are all things that we can't put a Band-Aid on. So today, though, we're going to spend most of our time on unplanned pregnancy. And um, that's what we're here to talk about. So let's talk about that. Because your teen years right now should be fun. They should be, you all are finishing up school, you probably just had prom, you got homecoming, you got bonfires and playing, uh, you know, having fun with your friends, shopping all those activities, playing ball, that's where your teen years should be. They shouldn't be filled with stress and worry. As you've probably seen on 16 and Pregnant Teen Mom, that is what we don't want for you all's life life. Because again, they're not being able to finish their education and all those things. Uh, their lives are right now filled with a lot of stress and worry. So if you had a friend right now that's faced with an unplanned pregnancy, what are the three options they are now facing? What are the three options they now face? Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Abortion. Okay. Okay, adoption. So we're going to go, it's abortion, adoption, and what we're going to call it parenting. A lot of times uh, students will say keeping it. That's what babysitters do. They keep a baby for a little while and they hand it back when it starts crying, okay? It needs other, uh, other care. But parenting is the other option, and that is something that you will do for the next 18 plus years of your life. It's not something you take a vacation from. It's not something you get a paycheck from. It is the hardest job you will ever do. So we've got parenting, abortion, and adoption. Who does that decision mostly affect more than anybody else? The baby. the baby is one. Who else does it impact? Yeah. The parents. Um, the parents are the parents, right? Um, we talked about the economy, what kind of effect it has on us. But the most that uh, the most impact this is going to have is going to be on this baby. Okay, so we need to kind of at this point not think of ourselves, but think what's best for the child. So we're going to give you all some facts about um, what we um, have shown in terms of what's best for the child. Does this person need at this point? Y'all think about this before you answer really quick. Does this young lady need your opinion about abortion, adoption, or parenting at this point in her life? Does she need your opinion? What do you think? I'm saying yes and no. Okay. I'm going to say that she doesn't need your opinion right now because your opinions change like the wind. Okay. I've got two teenagers myself. It changes based on the last Twitter feed they got or Instagram or who they're sitting by in class and all that kind of thing because right now you all are teenagers. You all are learning, growing, developing, maturing. So your opinions are going to change. They're probably be different from when you're an adult than you are right now. So your opinions are changing a lot, and maybe they're not always based on fact. And this young lady needs facts in order to make a really informed decision in her life because it's not going to impact her. We just talked about the child. So she doesn't need your opinion. Let's give her facts. So let's talk about the facts. All right, today teens are choosing these options and these, these percentages. 59% of teens will choose to parent, 27% will end in an abortion, 14% will end in a miscarriage, and then 1% will make an adoption plan for their child. So we're going to go through each one of these as they're kind of chosen, those percentages, and let's see which one rises to the top as the best for that child. Let's just see, you know, factually and statistically. All right, let's talk about parenting first. So this is a freshman group, right, or not? Freshman, sophomore, yeah. a little bit. Freshman. Okay. Well, anyway, a little bit of everybody. Okay. Well, at least in a year or two years, or maybe just recently, you're going to hopefully plan on graduating um, from Hillsborough. Correct? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. I know y'all are real excited. I don't see the enthusiasm there, but I'm sure y'all are hoping to plan from Hillsborough. What do you plan on doing after you graduate? Tell me some plans. College. What kind of careers? Think about. What was that? Oh, okay. I thought you said something. What are y'all thinking about? No, this class got to. A hard attorney. What else? Video technician. Technician? Video technician? Theater. 
theater. Oh, theater. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nursing. Nursing. Anything else? No, y'all are young. Y'all are still thinking about, what was that? Lawyer. Lawyer. Okay, great. These are great things. I want y'all to achieve all those things. I really think it's important. I'm on the Board of Education in Sumner County, and that's why I'm so passionate about your education and why I'm here. I do this every day. I want y'all to achieve that. Let's look at being a teen mom while trying to achieve that goal of finishing high school or college. Four out of ten teen moms will graduate from high school. Only four out of ten. Why is that number so low? Because they gotta stay home and take care of the What was that? Yeah, it's hard to focus. I heard it's hard, you know hard taking. I've heard some things in the audience. Hard taking care of a child and also doing your assignments. Think about your load right now in terms of your quizzes, exams, the end of course that you all just had, and the projects that you have to turn in, as well as trying to be a parent and trying to take care of a newborn baby, which needs care every two to four hours, has to be fed up all night long. What we hear from teachers is they start missing assignments, start falling asleep in class, they eventually drop out. It's the number one reason why teen girls will drop out of high school, number one. So if they drop out of high school, what kind of job can they get? McDonald's. Everybody says McDonald's, okay? <laughs> I challenge you all, because that's the number one answer on the price track, uh, or fairly few. Uh, I challenge you to go to McDonald's or Dairy Queen or any fast food establishment for that matter and ask them if they've got a bunch of high school dropouts working for them. And they're going to go, no. The job market is extremely competitive. Okay, did you have a question? Yeah, if the high school kids are working at McDonald's, why are 90% of the people taking your order so dumb and like giving me the wrong <laughs> Okay, all right, let's, get, let's refocus on what I'm saying here. Let's refocus on what I'm saying. I'm not saying that those establishments don't hire teenagers while they're in school. I'm asking you, does that manager hire a high school dropout? And I want to tell you no, because the market is very, very competitive. 60% of kids that drop out of high school will not find a job. 60%. Even college graduates now, they said 20% of them won't find a job. So imagine how competitive that market right now, and I've, I've asked the managers that, and they said no. I've got, in fact, when you turn 18, they're going to want to see your GED or high school diploma before you, they even hand you an application. So it's very, very competitive out there. So what now does a teen mom do if she hasn't graduated from high school, doesn't have her GED, how does she support her family? Okay, she just said it, welfare. Eight out of ten teen moms will go on welfare by the time their child is five years old. Eighty percent, almost every single one. So now we're paying for it. When you get a job, your parents back in April paid this huge amount of taxes, a lot of that's going to pay for that decision that they just made. That's why 67% of children of teen moms will live in poverty. And not only for them, so we just talked about the impact of the child living in poverty, the, the mother right now who can't find a job, but the father, if you become a teen dad, it's statistical that you will never make as much as a non-teen dad. So look at all three people who have already been impacted now in the nation by those decisions. Um, let's talk about college. I'll talk about you all wanting to go into college. I want you all to do that or trade school, military. I'm sure there's lots of different avenues you all want to go in here. Um, only 2% of teen moms will go on to college. 2%. It's almost non-existent. So that now has changed their life. Um, let's talk about another reality, unfortunately, for the children of these teen moms. Um, you all probably seen, you all watch Teen Mom? Mm -hmm. Okay, some, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, some no. Um, well, here's a couple of examples. We've got Janelle, who ever since she had Jace, um, has not been able to keep him. She lost custody of him right away because she was in jail for drugs and alcohol, out doing things that, uh, that teenagers do. Also, you've seen Amber, in jail as well, she lost custody of her little girl because, again, she couldn't stay off drugs and the very abusive and anger issues, so she's in jail, lost custody of her little girl. You've seen Farah battle with drug abuse, so her mom has had kind of in and out of care of their little girl. Um, the statistics are very, very high for these children to be pulled away to DHS services, Department of Human Services, because of abuse and neglect. Um, this one <coughs> right here is very close to my heart because in 2010 we got care of her because her mother started selling crack on the streets and prostituting in order to support her and her little brother. So when we got her, DHS took, obviously she went to jail and had to lose custody of her. And Naily Anna, um, when we got her, she had bed bug bites all over her skin. Her little brother had cigarette burns on his arms. So again, who are these decisions impacting the most? The child, absolutely. Um, so those are some things to think about. All right, let's talk about the guys for a second, because I know the guys are sitting there going, why am I here? Okay, first of all, it takes two people to make a baby, just so you know. Just in case you all didn't know that, okay, that's why you're here. Okay, and then the other thing is if you are being the father of that child, and I want the guys to really listen up on this. If you're being the father of that child, and a young lady chooses to parent, and she takes you to court because you are not financially meeting your obligations to that child, the average child support in the state of Tennessee is $600 a month. 
See, I know, it's exactly right. $600. If there's anything that guys remember from my presentation is how much they're going to have to end up paying for the next 18 years of their life. <clears throat> and just so you know, because I have two friends that are judges, those judges do <clears throat> not care if you're a minor. They don't care if you're the star basketball player. They don't care if you're the star football player. They could care less about any things that you bring to the table and say, I don't have a job. Well, I'm too young. Well, you should have thought about that before you started having sex because they're not going to care. Because when you start engaging in sexual activity, that's an adult activity. It has adult consequences. So when you bring a child into this world, that judge is going to say, you know what? Don't really want to hear your swan song because now you've got to pay for that child. Next 18 years of your life. Calculate that out and see what you're paying. Um, so we're going to hear some testimony on this and let's... We'll come back. Everything that your life is now is going to change. Everything from the minute that you wake up to the minute that you go to bed is going to be completely different. And your friends are going to change. School's going to change. Everything is going to change. I mean, that's completely changed how school is. You know, the high school I've ever pictured going to be. When football games come and homecoming week when everybody's going out and having a bonfire. Rick is Shannon Phillips' job. He's 17. He works cleaning tables at a pizza parlor after school and on the weekend. So it's just like, as I think about it, then we'll be a father. Like what I have for you. So I think I'll be saying, I'll be doing very hard work. I think it's a job. What was the common factor in both those testimonies, or all three? Is your life the same or did everything change? change. change. Everything change. changes. Friends change. Where you spend your money change. Maybe you have to get a full-time job. That all changes. And I was just watching the Teen Mom Marathon last weekend, listening to some of the girls because I try to get their perspective. This one young lady talked with another Teen Mom and said, I feel like I've aged 10 years with this decision. Because all my friends are going out and having fun and doing things. I watch them go off to college. And I now have aged myself 10 years by this decision that I made. Uh, many of them talk about the loneliness that they suffered from all their friends going out and doing things. And they are at home, again, um, with their child because everybody else is doing things. So they're, you know, by themselves. They're very lonely um, because, of, like I said, only one out of ten will end up marrying. So um, did, I, did I say that? Did I say one out of ten only marry? I don't know if I brought that up. Okay, I just want to make sure I brought that up. I couldn't remember if I said that in the last. But only one out of ten teen dads will end up marrying the child's mother. Um, so right here... If somebody came to you and said they were now faced with an unplanned pregnancy, where would you send them? Where would they go? Okay, obviously you talk with your parents because you've got some huge decision making to do. Um, so obviously that, and an OBGYN as well because right now you've got a living, breathing, growing child inside of you. And everything that you're doing, this baby is doing. You need to be eating healthy. This is a wellness class. I'm sure you've talked about eating healthy. And I know how teens eat because I've got two of them. And, uh, you know, so monster drinks, pizza, Doritos, Ho-Hos, Pop-Tarts. Well, that's not so great for the baby, okay? We need vitamins and nutrients because this baby's body is developing and growing, especially the first three months. And then whatever habits that you have, this baby has. If you're smoking, guess what? Baby's smoking. And babies can be born with asthma. If you're drugging, baby's drugging. Babies can be born with addictions to drugs and alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. And so imagine now the impact to that teen if they've got to spend their first couple of months down at Vanderbilt NICU because they've got an unhealthy child. Or maybe it may have lifelong implications for them because you all probably seen Leah and Corey on 16 and Pregnant. They had a twins and their one little daughter has a muscular deficiency now that she had to, she started going to college but had to stop going to college because she had to start doing physical therapy with her child with the muscular problems that she was having. So it's a huge, huge impact if you're not taking care of yourself on you and the life of that child. Um, so let's talk about the financial needs of this child. How much do you think it costs to raise a child today? Oh, Diaper, stroller, formula, car seat. Yes, sir, what do you think? $50,000. Okay, you're pretty close, actually. Um, you know, anywhere from $35,000 plus, it changes based on the economy and things go up with prices. Um, diapers are expensive. Formula is expensive. All the things that you have to get for your children are very, very expensive. So who's going to come up with that? Money, who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for daycare while you're in school? Because we, uh, we talked about the importance of staying in school. You know, so those are all important things to, to find out. And so somewhere else that you can go is a crisis pregnancy center, and they will help walk you through some of these things. I and mean, they also have you know, parenting classes. They can talk with you about adoption or some other options. So um, we have a HOPE Center that's very close to here, and um, I've got cards in the back if you just want to take a card and if somebody's maybe struggling with this issue, to talk to them about some things that they need to go through right now. All right, so let's listen to some testimony about this. Um, 
with paying ins insurance for Shannon and for um, a one-year-old toddler, the deductibles and stuff is really hard on us. The money that I could raise the baby is so much more than I could ever imagine. Before I had Jackson, I was so excited when school came because I could go to school shopping and go get my hair done and go buy new shoes and me and all my friends just go shopping all the time. Okay, where's your money going now? Baby. Baby, that's right. They suck it all from you, believe me. Okay. Uh, all right, let's talk to the risk to the children of teen moms. So there's absolute risk. Um, again, I think I, I can't believe I've told you all that statistic about the only one out of ten teen dads will end up marrying the child's mother. So this means this child will most likely grow up without a father. Is that good or bad? Bad. Okay, why is that? Talk to me about that. Yes. Because now, like, especially for the boys, they don't have a father to yeah. so, like, help raise them and, like, teach them, like, you're exactly right and that's what we see statistically if a boy does not have that male role model in their life it's crucially important to them because again who's going to you know do all those things that men like to do with men whether that's hunting fishing playing ball all those things and teaching them how to be a man and setting those boundaries and without that in their life we've seen statistically that boys of teen moms have a three to thirteen percent higher rate of going to jail because again if they're out misbehaving and doing things or trying to make up, you know, for where that deficiency is, they're getting in trouble a lot more. The girl of a teen mom has a 20% or 22% rate of being a teen mom himself, just a reiterated pattern. We also see some other factors. We see that they don't do as well in school, higher rate of repeating of grades, not doing as well in those standardized tests that you all just got through taking last week. We already talked about the abuse and neglect, higher rates of abuse and neglect, higher rates of poverty. Um, also, they abuse alcohol and drugs at a higher rate. So those are some of the things that you see um, from children of teen moms. I don't need a man to help me raise my babies. What we hear sometimes from teen moms, but actually what's statistically true, well, 90% of our homeless or runaway children are from a fatherless home. 70% of the teens in our state institutions are from a fatherless home. 63% of youth suicides are from a fatherless home. And 80% of all our prisoners in prison today are from a fatherless home. Now, I know that some of y'all are probably living this reality. Maybe you have a single mom at home. I'm not saying that you will become a statistic, okay? You have the power to overcome anything, and you don't have to be a victim to any circumstance. I'm not saying that. But what I'm wanting you to envision and think about is what you want for your life. What do you want for your children? What do you want for your family? And based on just this information, these statistics, again, um, what would you say about the father role in the home? Is it important? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, our own president, Barack Obama, talked about this in his book and saying that he realized the importance of the absence of fatherhood through his own father's absence in his life. So now we're going to have Joy come up and talk about the next option that's available. Thanks. Okay, so Beth has covered everything there is to know about being a teen parent in about 25 minutes. So do y'all feel like you have a better picture of what um, it looks like for your friends that might be going through teen pregnancy and having to make these difficult decisions. That's one of the reasons why we are so passionate about what we do because, as Beth said, she's on the school board in another county, not in Metro, but in another county, and I'm a former high school teacher. And we don't want to see anybody dropping out of high school and not finishing their education and ending up having to work at McDonald's. Not that McDonald's is a bad place or anything like that, but, you know, your future is just really limited when you drop out of high school. I had um, this girl that I know from um, where I live in Hendersonville and I was at the grocery store the other night and this lady that I know whose daughter got pregnant at 16 and um, she is parenting the child and she stopped me in the grocery store and said, what are your thoughts about um, Bethany getting a GED versus finishing out high school? And I was like, uh, finish high school. She'll make more money. Some, it, it would just be a much better scenario for her because she's wanting to quit. She's a junior. She's got one more year. So she's going to set the whole chart and course of her life with this decision. First of all, she decided to have sex. She wouldn't be here. Like Beth said, if you choose abstinence, you're not going to be here. You're not going to have to make this decision. Um, and one of the STDs, which we're, doing, we're getting some information on, just to go back to that, I just got some information last week from the um, Department of Health and Human Services. There's a new STD that they're saying is going to be the new AIDS. It's deadly and it's fast. Like before you even know you have it, it's gone beyond treatable. And it's deadly. So sex is not just a big price tag when it comes to pregnancy. Sex is a big price tag for your life, for your health. It's big. 
So please understand that we want you to make good, healthy decisions. We want you to live long, healthy, happy, satisfied, financially secure lives. And the only way to do that is to make good choices, okay? So the second most, uh, getting back to the program, the second most often chosen, and remember we're going in the order in which girls are making these choices. Most girls that get pregnant choose parenting. And then the second choice that they choose the most is, is abortion. Now, this option, we're not going to talk about the politics of it. We're not going to talk about our personal feelings about it because that has nothing to do with your friend who's 15 and pregnant because I have met a ton of pregnant girls over the 11 years I've been doing this. And every single one of them tells me this option crosses their mind. It may just be a fleeting thought, but it crosses their mind. So what does she need to know about this option? If she's going to make a decision that she will live with for the rest of her life, what does she need to know? Well, first of all, here's just some basic facts. There's about 1.2 million women each year in the United States that do choose this option. Um, there have been over 50 million abortions since 1973. Why is 1973 an important uh, year in this topic? Yes, sir. Yes, that's when the Roe v. Wade <coughs> Supreme Court decision of the United States Supreme Court legalized abortion as an option. So it is a legal option uh, for women in our country. 17 children are adopted for every 1,000 that are aborted, just to kind of give you a comparison of uh, these last two options, and we'll talk about adoption in just a minute. There are two types of abortion. If a friend of yours says she's getting abor an abortion, there's two ways that that happens. One is surgical and one is chemical, and we'll talk about that. And most abortions occur between 4 and 12 to 14 weeks of pregnancy. Now, this is a fetal model, and if you're wanting to look at it after class, you can come up. This is exactly the size and weight and what it looks like at 12 weeks after conception. Um, this is basically the word fetus means young one, developing child, offspring, or baby. They all kind of are used interchangeably. So this is what your health textbook uses the, the phrase fetus, embryo, baby, all kind of interchangeably. So that's what we're talking about. So let's look at what this um, friend of yours who's pregnant might need to know. Well, what we have heard from everyone, and I do mean everyone, whether they're my age or your age, that has had an abortion, they all say one thing. They need to know the facts about fetal development. Okay, we've already established that the, uh, through your health textbook, that life begins at conception. What is conception? What does that mean? What's conception? Yes, sir. Okay, the sperm from the male penetrates the egg that's released from the female's body, and that new um, union of sperm and egg creates that new human being. Okay, at the moment of conception, all of the DNA that you have, you don't get anything else. Nothing else gets added into that, okay? Everything is right there at that moment. So according to your health textbook and all the medical textbooks and science textbooks and biology textbooks say that life begins at that moment. And 18 to 22 days after conception, the heart starts to beat. Does your friend know she's pregnant at 18 to 22 days after she's conceived? No. Probably not. She may suspect something, but she probably doesn't know. Now, 40 to 45 days later, the brain activity begins in that little teeny tiny cell. Um, does she know she's pregnant by that point? Probably does. She's missed her period, and she may have taken a pregnancy test or two. She may have talked to her health teacher, gone to the school nurse, um, gone to a, a doctor. She may have already talked to someone about the fear that she has that she's pregnant. Now, all of your major organs and body parts were present at eight weeks after conception. These are some fetal ultrasound pictures. You can see an eight-week ultrasound on the left, and then these two right here are ten-week twins. The one on the left, we kind of... Um, call it the kidney bean because it kind of looks like a kidney bean. But you can still very clearly see, well, maybe not because it's a little grainy in here. You can still clearly see the head and the stomach and then the legs are over here. Um, and then here you can see everything. You can see the head, the nose, the mouth, the stomach. There's the little legs and the feet propped up against the inside of the mom's uterus. Now, this picture you can see very well. This is a 15-week ultrasound picture, so just a little bit larger than this, the 12-week fetus. Now, somebody tell me what you see in that picture. See what? Head, okay. Nose, mouth. The spine. Yeah, you can see the, yeah, brain. 
What do you see that? What's that white line running down the back? Okay, that's the spinal cord. What are those white things in the gum lines? Teeth. Teeth. I never knew until I saw this ultrasound, because I'm not a biology major, um, I never knew that babies in the womb already had their teeth buds inside their gum line. Um, of course, they're not going to be born with teeth. That comes later. But those, uh, those teeth uh, are already there. So what do you see in the middle of this picture? I hope I can. There you go. Right there. What's that right there? The hand. That's the, the fetus, the baby's hand, sticking up like this with the thumb out. And guess what that baby's getting ready to do? Suck its, suck its thumb. Because this is a friend of mine's daughter. She's the assistant principal at Hendersonville High School. And she used to be the wellness teacher there. And so five years ago, she gave us her ultrasound pictures because she had a ton of them. And this is Kennedy, who's now five, and she said as soon as they snapped that picture on the ultrasound machine, Kennedy popped her thumb in her mouth and started sucking her thumb, and they could watch it on the ultrasound monitor. Um, now, this is National Geographic. National Geographic did um, an amazing thing back in 2007. This is called Life in the Womb, and what it is, it's 4D ultrasound. So think of a picture versus a video. This is actual footage. This is not a movie. This is actual footage of babies, fetuses, inside the womb. So we can see what's going on. You can see um, this one's going to yawn. That's so weird. They do a lot of sleeping in, in there because they're growing really, really, really fast. That one jumped. That one's asleep. See the cord there that's uh, the umbilical cord? That's where the nourishment's coming to the baby. That's why it's important what pregnant women eat and drink. Yeah, that one's going to blink. They look like an alien. <laughs> See, there's the umbilical cord. This one's going to um, kind of jump like maybe it's startled. Why do they kick? Why do they kick? Why do we stretch? Why do we kick? Why do we move around? <laughs> this one cries. I did not know that babies cried inside the womb. That one cried. And then there's the cord feeding into the baby. Now, before we leave that topic, if a woman is taking drugs of any kind, legal or illegal, are those going into the baby? Yes. Yes. If she's drinking alcohol, is that going into the baby? Yes. Yes. If she's smoking cigarettes, are those chemicals going into the baby? Yes. Yes. All of those things can have very serious consequences for the baby's health. Babies can be born addicted to alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. Babies can be born addicted to drugs. Babies can be born with asthma because their mom smoked while she was pregnant. So all of the things that women do when they're pregnant, if your friend comes up to you and says she's pregnant, the most important thing you can tell her to do is go back there and see that school nurse. Because she needs to start taking prenatal vitamins to get those vitamins in her body so the baby will grow healthy. And then she stops eating you know, the typical teen diet, as Beth said. She needs to be eating healthy and doing some things a different way. If she smokes cigarettes, she needs to quit. If she drinks alcohol, she needs to quit because she's going to damage that child that's growing inside of her. Um, so, we've gone over the fetal development. Why is it important for girls who are pregnant to know about that developing fetus inside of them? Who can tell me? Yes, on the back row. Right. Right, to make choices, yes, what were you going to say? Yeah, side effects of making bad choices for the growing and developing baby. But what about this, we're talking about abortion. Why would a woman, why do all the girls that we meet that have had abortion say, you need to tell them about fetal development? Yes. That is one of the side effects, yes, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Well, one of the reasons why they tell us it's important is because not knowing information, is that good for you? If you're making a lifelong decision, is it good for you not to know all the information? No. No, it no. isn't. So they want to know this information to be able to make a decision that, again, that they're going to live with for the rest of their life. So the two most common uh, types of procedures when we talk about surgical procedures, most all abortions, about 80 to 85 percent of abortions in the U.S., our surgical procedures. If she is pregnant, she's going to not be pregnant anymore, right? That's what the purpose of abortion is, is to not be pregnant anymore. So if this is the fetus that's growing inside of her uterus, um, they say that a woman's uterus is about the size of her fist when she's not pregnant, okay? 
So if she has a fetus growing inside of her uterus, abortion is going to remove that fetus. So how's that done? Well, basically, um, in a surgical procedure, they're going to have to dilate her cervix. Do you know what the cervix is? It's the opening to the uterus. How many of you have heard of somebody say about a pregnant woman that's about to have a baby, she's dilated so many centimeters? Yeah. Okay. That's when her cervix starts to open and the baby's going to be delivered, okay? In a normal pregnancy at 40 weeks, it's time for the baby to be born. So the cervix dilates on its own because it's time for the baby to be born. In an early pregnancy, the cervix is not open because it's staying shut to keep the, ba the fetus, the baby, inside. So what's going to happen is they're going to have to dilate the cervix. They're going to have to open it because they got to get in there. And so they're going to open that with either um, medical instruments or drugs or a combination of both to force the cervix to open. And then once it's open, they're going to go in with medical instruments and remove the fetus from the uterus. Now, it's not going to come out looking like this because that's not the way the procedures work. It usually comes out dissected and dismembered, and the contents are suctioned uh, through a tube. So that's basically how it's done. Sometimes ultrasounds are used to determine the size of the fetus to know which of the methods of abortion to use. Some of the complications, as one of the young guys said earlier, is that it can lead to infertility. Um, those instruments that are used to remove the fetus from uh, the woman's uterus can sometimes puncture the uterine wall, and it's called a perforated uterus, and when that happens, she's probably not ever going to have a baby. I have two personal friends that that happened to in college. They had abortions in college. The uterus was perforated due to the instruments that they used to remove the fetus, and so neither one of them were able to have children as a result of that. And sometimes there can be scar tissue that's left inside the uterus, and then she won't be able to be pregnant. So infertility, I met a girl at a school out in Williamson County about three years ago that had had an abortion, and she bled for eight and a half, almost nine weeks straight. It was like having a period for two months. So heavy bleeding can be one of the consequences. So um, she just needs to know all of the facts about what she's doing so that she's making an informed decision. Now, the second type of abortion is a chemical abortion. And this is basically going to involve drugs that she takes that's going to end the pregnancy. And these are becoming more common. Uh, the FDA has just um, said that high school girls can take this drug as early as age 15. It's called the morning after pill or plan B. Now this pill works two ways. It can prevent pregnancy, yes. It can be a contraceptive. What is a contraceptive supposed to do? Yes. Yes, prevent pregnancy. It's not supposed to um, allow a pregnancy to take place, like condoms, birth control pills, yada yada, okay? What is a monster drink? It's an energy drink, and what, what does it consist of? Caffeine and sugar, right? It's like a jacked up cup of coffee, okay? This is a jacked up birth control pill. It is a very heavy dose of the birth control pill. And so what happens... Um, I read an article, a health article last summer that said um, this particular health organization was concerned that teenagers particularly were taking this drug as if it were a birth control pill and taking it consistently. And they don't know the long-term effects of this level of chemicals on a woman's body. So they were concerned that teenagers were just taking this every time they had unprotected sex and not realizing this has a lot of chemicals in it that we don't know how they're going to affect a woman's body. So if the girl knows the following three things, she can use the morning after pill successfully to prevent a pregnancy. And that is when she had her last period, she knows that, most girls know that. When she had unprotected sex, most girls know that, not all. Sometimes they think he used protection. Sometimes they're drunk, so they don't always know. And then the third thing they have to know is when did they ovulate? What is ovulation? Thank you. When the body, when the female body releases the egg, and when that egg is released, that's when pregnancy can happen, okay? How many girls know when they ovulate? No. Very few. There are ovulation test kits on the market that sell for about 40 bucks to women that are trying to get pregnant, and they can't, so they go get these test kits and pee on the stick to see when the hormone is in there so that they can get pregnant. They know that's the time that they're ovulating, so that's when they should have sex. So it's a very difficult thing for women to know when they ovulate. What happens if she ovulates on a Wednesday, has sex on Thursday, and then says, ooh, 
I better go take that morning after pill. And she takes the morning after pill on, say, Friday. Well, she could have already conceived. Conception could have already happened. And if that happens, then the chemicals in this drug harden the wall of the uterus. So if there's a conceived egg, a fertilized egg in her body, it's not going to be able to plug into her uterine wall. So then what's going to happen to that little tiny fertilized egg? It'll die. It's going to die because it can't get nourishment. So then this becomes a chemical abortion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it can be either or. It depends on this stuff. And it can only be used up to 72 hours after unprotected sex. So there's a very narrow window of time. Now this next pill is called the abortion pill. It's RU486, and it has been legal in the United States since about 2000, so for about 13 years. Um, it is a series of pills, and it can be used up to 49 days from the last day of the menstrual cycle. Is that what it says? Yeah. No, that's not what it says. I don't know. First day. Why would... First day to last day be a big deal. Because, <clears throat> you know what? If we grew, I read this in a, a, an article. If we grew as fast after we're born as we do during that nine months while we're in the uterus, we'd be the size of T Rex dinosaurs. <laughs> that's how much, that's why they sleep so much. Because they're growing so fast, okay? So five days in the growth and development of a fetus is like a year to you. So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, says this drug cannot be used after 49 days from the first day of her last menstrual period. So that's, again, a very narrow window of time. So what it does is the first pill that she's given is going to kill the fetus, and then the second pill that she's given is going to cause her body to go into contractions. Contractions are what have to happen when you give birth. That's the pain that's involved. It pushes the baby out. Her uterus starts contracting. Well, that's going to have to happen in this to push this out. So what can happen, though, these are some of the things that will happen, is heavy bleeding, severe cramping. Um, the fetus will be uh, killed by the chemicals, and then she will basically, this will happen at home. She's going to take the drugs, and then uh, the uterine contractions are going to start. What a lot of girls don't understand is if they don't go back to the doctor for that follow-up visit, they think, well, I saw it all come out and, you know, I'm good to go, and they get back to their life, and they don't realize that there could still be fetal tissue left in their body. There could still be part of the placenta left in their body. So what happens when there's dead human tissue inside of a person's body? What's going to happen? It's going to decay. And that's going to cause septic poisoning. It's going to cause possibly shock. It's going to cause her to go into um, all kinds of medical issues. We've had 14 women in this country die as a result of this drug. And we've had hundreds of women have to be hospitalized and get blood transfusions because that decaying tissue has poisoned their bloodstream. Did you have a question over here? Yeah, you know, what did it say about us being dinosaurs or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, it had to do with the growth. So this can be a very serious medical issue for women, wouldn't you say? We need to understand it. It's not just a pill that you take and it's your problem's over. This can have some serious issues that she needs to deal with. Yes. So it only takes like two pills. The first pill is the um, misopristone, and that's what kills the fetus. And then the second drug is the misoprostol, and I don't think I'm saying that correctly, that's the drug that causes the uterine contractions. <laughs> not instant, no, not instant, but it's going to happen within a couple of days. Everybody's, and you have to think about this, does one aspirin or one ibuprofen stop your headache? No. For some people, maybe. For some people, it may be two or three. You know, Beth has serious headaches. I don't think one aspirin is going to dent her headache. If I'm having a migraine and I have migraines, and Beth does too, I'm not taking an aspirin because it's not going to dent my headache. So I'm going to have to take special drugs. So everybody's body processes drugs in a different way. So you can't say for certain how fast this is going to happen in everybody's situation, but generally it's going to happen within, you know, two to five days. Okay? So why is this option so difficult? Oh, 
It's a difficult decision because it's a final choice. Once she makes this decision, she can't change it. She can change her parenting decision. If she chooses to be a parent and realizes that it's too hard, she can't do it, she can always change to adoption. If she chooses adoption, gets to the delivery room, gives birth and says, I can't go through with it, she can change back to parenting. So see, there's a change opportunity on both of the other two options, but on this one, once she's made her decision, it's final. There's no changing. Mm -hmm. So she needs to know all of the information so that she can make an educated decision because it, this one is final. Um, and it does involve life. These are some of the reasons women choose um, abortion, that they want to finish their high school or college education. They don't have the money to raise a child. They don't want to have anything to do with the baby daddy. He was a jerk. It was a one-night stand, whatever. Um, they you know, don't want to live with their parents until they're 45 years old. Whatever. So those are some of the reasons why women choose abortion. Do you see that all of those same reasons can be accomplished through another option as well? So they can get the same outcome from two options. And the other option is adoption, which is the last option we're going to talk about. And this is the one that people know the least about. This is the one that people your age still think that it looks like it did in the 1950s. You weren't even on the planet. Heck, I wasn't even on the planet. I'm way older than you in the 1950s. <laughs> Adoption does not look at all like most people think it looks. It's not giving away a baby, as someone just said. People who choose adoption are not looking at it as, oh, well, I'm just going to walk away from my responsibility. You're going to hear some testimonies in just a moment. There's over 2 million couples that are waiting to adopt. How do we know that number? How, did we just pull that out of the air, or how do they know that number? The process. Yes, you cannot just go down to Baptist Hospital and say, hey, I'll take that cute little brown-haired, brown-eyed baby right there um, and walk out of the hospital. They're going to arrest you for kidnapping <laughs> and put you in jail. So you can't do that. If you want to adopt a child, you have to go through a very lengthy process. Trust me, it is very lengthy. You have a stack of paperwork about that thick that you have to fill out. You have to have your FBI fingerprints uh, sent in. I mean, the government has to check your background to see if you've ever been convicted of a crime. And if you have, you will not be in that two million. Literally, there are people that cannot adopt children because of something they did in their 20s. Because they have a criminal record. Our, you know, our laws are very strict about adoption. Not just anybody can adopt a child. So that we know that because that's how many people in the United States have, done, uh, have gone through the adoption process and done the work to become adoptive parents. Yet, less than 1% of all crisis pregnancies will end in an adoption plan. Why do you think that so few girls that get in unplanned pregnancies choose adoption? Because they get attached to the baby. Okay. Yep. Uh, emotional attachment to the baby. Yes. They, that baby's been growing and developing inside of them for nine months, and they've felt it kick and move, and they've seen ultrasound pictures, and they've grown emotionally attached. What's another reason that girls don't choose adoption? Yes. Right, right. With abortion, it's, it can be kept secret. Um, with adoption, you're obviously, people are going to have to know that you're pregnant. Yes. Any other reasons why girls don't choose adoption? You know, <clears throat> that's the whole reason that this program got started 11 years ago, is because my best friend's daughter was 15 and pregnant. And she made the decision to choose adoption. And every day at her high school in Sumner County, this is what she heard. You're going to give your baby away? Why don't you want to keep your baby? Don't you love your baby? How could you do that? Nobody does that anymore. It happens every day. One of the most dangerous places a girl can be if she's pregnant is in a high school classroom. Because every day she's going to hear wrong information. She's going to hear negative information. And especially if she chooses adoption, She's going to be vilified. People are going to make her feel very bad 
about her choice. Because for whatever reason, people see adoption as giving away and she doesn't love this child. But they're okay. Pardon? But they're okay with her taking some jacked up birth control pills. Yes, what were you going to say? The abortion, like you're killing the baby, like all, all together. Adoption, you can have hope, like maybe there is a family that is like more financially stable than you are to raise a child. I mean, and then maybe you can maybe get it back or something. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, good, good um, thought. Aren't you like still in the baby's life? Yes. Even after? Yes, so we're going to talk about that in just a second. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes people that adopt babies, they, just, they can't have babies. So, right. And do you know that as infertility rises because of STDs, there's going to be more of a demand for adoption because a lot of people in this classroom are going to find out someday when they're trying to get pregnant that they can't, and it might be the result of an STD. Um, as STDs go up, infertility goes up. So we're going to start. We're going to continue to see an increase in the demand for adoption. But unless we change our thoughts about what adoption is from the birth mother's perspective, she's not giving her child away. A lot of times we use negative language. Don't ever say to a pregnant girl, are you going to keep your baby or are you going to give it up? What have you just automatically implied to her? You've said something very powerful to her with those two phrases. Keep or give up. What kinds of things do you keep? Valuable stuff, things that you value. What kinds of things do you give away? Things you don't care about. Things you don't want. You have just told her with those two phrases that you think that if she loves the child, she will keep it, and if she doesn't love it, she'll give it up. And nothing could be further from the truth because these young girls that choose adoption walk through hearing those negative comments every single day from teachers, from classmates, from friends, from boyfriends, parents, whatever. And yet they want so much for their child. So what are, what are we looking at? What does adoption look like today? We're going to watch a video clip from MTV 16 and Pregnant. This is Caitlin and Tyler, and we're going to hear their story. Um, get pictures of her and stuff. 
So what, what we would do when we're looking at an affidavit is we look at what's called a profile book. It's mm -hmm. a book that they put together that has pictures about them, that shows their interests in life, and you have the ability to look through these. So I can send them to you publicly today. You have to come to a place where you uh, make a decision about what's right for you. Okay. And we'll find you if you look at the details of the model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh,
They wanted to finish school and go to college. Yes, ma'am. How she told us about her background, how she don't play good. Yeah, and they have very homes. dysfunctional, unstable homes, and they didn't want Carly to be exposed to that. You know, they have still to this day, Carly's going to be four, they have not allowed Carly's um, biological grandparents to meet her. That's Caitlin and Tyler's decision, not the adopted parents. Caitlin and Tyler don't want their parents to see Carly because their parents are so dysfunctional. Oh. Tyler's dad's in jail, has been in jail all of Tyler's life. Caitlin's mom is an alcoholic and a drug abuser. So they don't want Carly anywhere near that. So what were you going to say? Somebody else had a, somebody else had a hand up. Oh, what did you want to say? <laughs> they weren't emotionally stable, financially stable. They didn't want their parents to have any influence on Carly. In other words, what Caitlin and Tyler will tell you, if they were standing right here, um, and we usually have them come and speak with us. They were supposed to be here in town this weekend, but that got canceled due to circumstances out of our control. They've actually gone with us to Hillwood. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. They just happened to be in town that day. We didn't know, you know, but they just called us and said, hey, we're in town. This is what they wanted for Carly. This is why they went through the decision to make an adoption plan for her. It wasn't about them. It was about Carly. They wanted Carly to have a stable, married mom and dad home. And now Carly has a baby brother because last March, Brandon and Teresa, her parents, adopted little Graham, and so she has a baby brother now. But Caitlin and Tyler did not give Carly away. What did they give Carly? A future. And that's exactly what Tyler would say, is we gave Carly a better kind of future. And I'm going to let Beth kind of compare and contrast what Carly has to the situation with Naliana. Um, you all heard that we had took care of her in 2010. Well, even after her mom has now been in prison two years of her, she's five now, the last two years, and then she got out and could not stay um, in rehab, couldn't keep a job, so now she was out prostituting in on the streets and everything. But her mom still has not released her um, in terms of to allow rights to be given up so that she could be adopted. So now she's gone three years really without any contact with her mother or father. Her father's also in jail for crack addiction and selling crack and that kind of thing. So how would her life be different than Carly's if, if maybe her mom had made an adoption plan for her? What do you think would be the difference in those two? She would be going around from place to place to place and being, you know, she's probably had about five caregivers um, since she's been in the system. Um, which is sad because we wanted her to have a mom and dad home, obviously just like Carly. So those are just kind of like a contrast there. Yeah, we bring that up because, see, what a lot of times girls don't understand is when they get pregnant, um, Teenagers particularly, over 50% of the children of teen moms suffer either neglect or abuse to the point that the state of Tennessee has to step in. And some of those children get taken out of those homes, like Naliana. And so then, does the teen mom have any control over where the child goes? No. no. Do Caitlin and Tyler have control over where their daughter went? Yes. yes. They picked the parents. Do you see the difference? Yeah. They picked Brandon and Teresa for Carly. And so they get to see Carly grow up and see her thrive and grow. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. You know how they have an open adoption? Uh -huh. When the child starts to mature a bit more, doesn't that kind of get awkward? You know, realizing that your parents kind of uh, gave you for adoption? Well, they don't give... Let me just, let me paraphrase that. Let me go forward, okay? I think I, there's three types of adoption. There's open, semi-open, and confidential. This is the way all adoptions used to be. No information. Birth mother didn't have any idea where the child went. Child didn't know birth mom. That's the way it used to look, okay? It doesn't look like that anymore. Nobody chooses this. It's still there if a girl wants a confidential adoption, but very few girls choose that. They want to have pictures, letters, updates, or they want to have an open adoption. So that's the way adoption looks. Um, Y'all know who this guy is. He coached the um, Indianapolis Colts. i got to go in there and change that. That's the wrong PowerPoint. Um, but anyway, he's an adopted dad, and now that he's retired, he goes around the country speaking to high school and college students about the benefits of adoption. This is my family. This is my child. He did not grow in my belly. I have an unexplained infertility diagnosis. They could not figure out why I couldn't get pregnant. So my son's birth mother um, chose adoption for him. She was 19 when she got pregnant, 20 when she delivered him. Um, in Knoxville at UT Medical Center. She chose adoption for him because she wanted him to have the exact same kind of life she had. She knew she wasn't going to marry his birth father. It was not a serious relationship. And so she chose adoption for him because this is what she wanted for him. She didn't give him away. And now he's going to be 14 on Saturday. His birthday is also mm -hmm. Saturday. And he spoke last Saturday night to a gathering of birth mothers, girls who had made adoption decisions. 
And do you know what he said to them? Thank you. Thank you for choosing adoption. I get to have the kind of life that my birth mom wanted me to have. He doesn't see her as not loving him. He sees her as a hero, as someone who carried him for nine months and then made a very hard decision to place him in my arms as his mother to be able to take care of him and raise him and love him. And if you tried to harm this child, you were coming over my dead, cold body. You got it? The girl that breaks his heart is probably going to have a broken arm. I'm just saying. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not really. Not really. I will hurt you. Or as my friend Paula says, I will cut you. You know what I'm saying. Moms are very protective over their sons, are they not? Very protective. Don't want anybody hurting them. Did you have a question back here? Yes, we did. We did. Actually, um, there's a video of him speaking at the event Saturday night. And so this afternoon, I just got it sent to me yesterday, and this afternoon I'm going to email her and send her the link on YouTube so that she can watch his speech. And then we got a gift for her. It's a little bracelet that they gave out to all the birth moms. And every year at Christmas and on her birthday, we send her presents. We send her kids presents. She went back to Michigan, where she's from, after she gave birth to him in 1999. And um, a couple of years later, got back together with her high school boyfriend. And they're now married and have two children. And so we send their kids presents and you know all that kind of stuff. So we have a wonderful relationship with them. But just if my son were standing here, he would tell you, I'm not giving up. My birth mom didn't give me up. She didn't choose it because she didn't love me. She chose it because she wanted me to have a different kind of life than what I would have had if she had chosen to parent me because they were not going to get married. And her life would have looked very different. And she's very healthy and happy and glad. Yes, what did you say? Anybody? Any questions? <laughs> Choices have consequences. All three of these options are hard. If your friend is 16 and pregnant, she does not have an easy option. Parenting is hard. Abortion is hard. Adoption is hard. They are all three hard choices. So if you choose to be abstinent, you will never have to make that decision. It will not be yours to make. But you may have to walk through a friend who's having to make this decision if your close friend is, is pregnant. Um, so again, just another reason to make good, healthy choices so that you can have the kind of life that you deserve to have and that you want to have. Y'all have any questions about any of this? Y'all were great. Y'all had great comments, great questions. Very good. Very good kids. Good kids. We like them. Yeah, you, you think you'll keep them? <laughs> for a couple more years anyway. Oh, yeah. for some of them. this year, they yeah. Well, I hope y'all have a great summer. And right, why don't we thank them, guys, for coming in?